If you like what you're hearing on the phillytech.org netcast network, please consider supporting the network with a small monthly donation via patreon.com slash phillytechorg. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash p-h-i-l-l-y-t-e-c-h-o-r-g. And thank you in advance. You're listening to the Social Media Addicts Podcast on the phillytech.org netcast network. Sponsorship provided by Get Flywheel, optimized WordPress hosting at getflywheel.com, wistia.com at w-i-s-t-i-a.com, and Zoho Mail. Hey everybody, and welcome to episode 22 of the Social Media Addicts Podcast. Nothing ha- happy happens now at age 22. It's just another year. You know, so anyhow, if you missed last episode, it was 21, and before that was 20, so those are two big milestones, a whole decade, two decades done, and 21 drinking! So now 22, it's sort of like, now what? So anyhow. Now it's just the early 20s, and, you know, we're going to be hipsters. We're going to be hipsters. Grow beer, our beard out about here. You know, you know how it goes. But anyhow, we are Jody List this week. She's getting ready for a dog show, so we know her where her priorities are. No, I'm joking. Clearly, clearly. But honestly, you know, her dogs—that's her—that's her passion, and we we encourage her full heartedly. And hopefully, you know, Jewel will win another ribbon and get that much closer to being a grand champion. So we'll be rooting for you, Jody. Ra 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 ra. Anyhow. So if you want to support these shows on the pod, on the on the Philly Tech Podcast Network, Netcast Network, excuse me, I don't know the name of the show right now. It's so late. Yeah, you know, go to patreoncom org and give where you can, and it was very much appreciated. Um, our three sponsors of the week are the usual: Westia, Flywheel, and Zoho Mail. Shall we get started, Mr. Howard? Let us get started. Awesome. So pinpoint targeting and animated ads are coming soon to Pinterest. Well, yay. so yay and boo, in my opinion. All yay right, from the pinpoint targeting. So giving advertisers control to adver- to like get to a very specific audience, I'm all in favor of. Um, it's something that the more clients that want to work with paid ads, giving them controls that say, here are the people you're going to go after, that's great. I absolutely love that. Um, animated ads, uh, I have a hard enough time with interrupting ads, let alone having them dance. And Mm -hmm. I just, this is one of those things where it's going to be, and ad executives are going to love that they can interrupt and make fun things. And I just think it's going to make it another reason why people are going to reject the ads. And I'm a little bit concerned because I think about, um, we'll talk about this a little later with Instagram, but when I think about how different... um, Social networks really experiment with their ad platforms. This seems very heavy-handed all at once for the ads. So, yeah, yeah, meet this. I would like to add, please. Um, Not working too well. Yeah. So what do you think about this? I don't know. The pinpoint targeting looks neat. And then as far as the GIFs go or the animated stuff, I think of the Facebook timeline or I think of um, Google Plus in its heyday when you're doing animated GIFs. And good old Linda D would put out the most obnoxious. Um, Linda D was the person who put out a lot of uh, anime gifts. It was every hour on the hour she put out another gif, <laughs> and it would like just destroy your stream. Right. So thank you, Linda, for that. But uh, I just you know I'm just like I'm, I'm over the gif or the gif, whatever, 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 whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But I just think the way um, Pinterest is formulated. You have this tile layout, which is really nice. So if you have an ad, it doesn't really take over the whole area, and it looks nice, and people might actually click on it. Right. If you have an animated, hey, look at me, 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 it gets really annoying, and all you're going to be doing is be greeted by, you know, crickets. You, you know, I'd, so I'd almost wish must. it was just an excuse to use the sound effect. I know. Believe me, I know. Yeah, I know. Um, it's almost like if you think about how they have that masonry layout with all the different mm-hmm. things sort of overlapping, if what they did was instead of doing just something that's a bo- one of the boxes of a different height, if they did it as a double-width masonry tile, uh, that would give you – it would be big, 
but it would still not interrupt the flow, but it would be visually big without it being adver like an advertisement. Again, something where you could use a more standard sort of a... Um, most of Pinterest stuff is tall, so you do something yes. that's a little wider and, and narrow. You do sort of like the 16 by 9 aspect ratio. You plop that in the middle of that masonry layout. It's going to stand out. That's something where I would have liked to see Pinterest try things like that. Really innovate with that ad platform. What works? What gets people to click on it? If the goal is to get attention, you know, dancing bananas is one way to get attention. And that's a way to How annoy people. That attention? So it, it's the kind of thing that uh, effectively instead of three columns, you know, taking over the whole thing, take over two of the three. Someone can still scroll through and go, oh, that looks cool. It will just seem like a big feature as opposed to, um, you know, an obvious, like, smack in your face, mm -hmm. annoying ad. So I would have liked well, to see some smack in your like face, that. but it won't be dancing. Uh, yeah, and you know it's going to be dancing. I mean, they're going to use dancing bananas. Yeah, uh, even when we did, we'll report on it here yes. first. So. Yes. So here, here's another thing. Why using websites, blogs, email, and newsletters is always more effective than social media sites? I thought this was a very interesting article because what it highlights is that your owned con your owned content versus your rented content, your own content like your website, you know, your blog, and your email newsletter is stuff that you own. It's content that you have control over versus the social media sites where you, where you kind of are like at the mercy and at the whim of Facebook at, at the whim of Google. It's saying that it's more important to focus, even still focus on your own content and then syndicate out to the, the other social media sites. I mean, what say you, what say you Howard? Um, I absolutely agree. Uh, this is something I've always preached, that the assets that you control are the ones you have to take care of the most. So, yes, you can absolutely do well with Facebook, with Twitter, with Google+, with Pinterest, with all of these different networks, but all it takes is one change of an algorithm and something that you may have been strategically building now becomes worthless. Think about all of the changes that Facebook has made to business pages and how much they show up and, you know, basically they went from, hey, here's a whole lot of free audience to you better pay. Now, absolutely. in doing that, you may have spent years and used employees to try to build up that content on Facebook, and now it's effectively worthless, where if you had done that same effort on content on your own website, you still have its value. So, yeah, I agree, um, because who knows what the next, uh, as Jimmy Fallon likes to put it, the next you twit face is going to be um, <laughs> in terms of the different networks that are going to come out, whether or not, you know, is this latest thing that Pinterest doing, is that going to kill the network? So if you've been putting a lot of effort into Pinterest and, you know, pinning lots of things and developing a community, does something like their new ads, does that actually subvert your ability to reach your, quote, organic audience, the audience that you've built using their platform? That's, you know, it's a tough thing if you just think that, hey, I can just get my audience over here. You know, hey, I've got a huge audience on Google+, Plus, so I'm just going to focus on that and not worry about my own website. Um, yeah, I think it's a little short-sighted to forget about your own stuff. Yes. I, I ultimately, I'm not saying don't use Facebook, don't use LinkedIn, don't use Twitter, don't use all the other all the other platforms. Use them as distribution channels. The way I do, I post my blogs first on my, my blog, whatever, whatever blog I want to post it on. I, I post it there, and then what I'll do is I'll syndicate it to LinkedIn, and I'll say, hey, this first appeared over here. The canonical is over here. Please go, if you want to see the original content, please go over here and link to the content over here. Whether or not they actually do or not, it's another matter, but you know, you're still getting your word out, but you still own the content. I think about it this way. If you create a video, creating the video is the hard part. Distributing it to YouTube or to Facebook video or Twitter video or posting it on your own site, these are all things that you can do with that video content. So not getting it on your site to live on your site, um, there may be a practical reason that you don't do it, but it's still your video. So if YouTube changed, you know, right now YouTube's very generous with what videos you could host on your own website. You could also use a platform like one of our sponsors, Wistia. You could Which do it for other hosting. Um, the idea being you can use a platform to get your videos on your site. 
mm -hmm. platform is something that you might be paying for, you might use a third party for, it might just be you're hosting it yourself and paying extra bandwidth. Whatever you're doing for that, repurposing it by uploading it directly to Facebook. So yeah, it might be a quote different video. You're not just sharing the link from uh, YouTube, but your home base is still yours. So if Facebook ever decides, hey, you know what? If you want to host video on a business page, we're charging you, you know, a dollar per video. If they decided they wanted to do that, and all you'd ever done was put your videos on Facebook, you would have a massive undertaking to try mm -hmm. to move that around. So oh, yeah. if you just think about that. Out. Exactly, and just think about how you could, um, how how are their current rules set, and how those rules would really impact you if they changed just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, simple things like on a Facebook page, if you have a button that takes you to the website, they've introduced those little, you know, you can't customize those buttons if it fits in one of those things. You know, at the top of a Facebook page, um, yeah. those little call to action buttons. Well, I'm hoping at some point they let you customize it, but if they don't. I want people to still have a good call to action. So how do you work within their system? What that means is I want that call to action to get them to the website. I don't mm -hmm. want to depend on Facebook to do it because they're going to change how they do call to action. They're going to experiment. They're going to try things. They're going to make you pay for it at some point. Whatever that is, I have to be ready by having my own home base covered. Absolutely. And a good company to do that with would be with Wistia. Wistia. Uh, hold on. Don't jump the gun. I have to get to this. I wasn't on the ball here. Here we go. And Wistia. Well, today's show is sponsored by Wistia. In fact, most of the shows that I've been on have been sponsored by Wistia for the Philly Tech, or the, yes, the phillytech.org netcast network. Well, what Wistia does is they are a video hosting and analytics platform. It helps businesses get the most out of their online video. We use Wistia here at phillytech.org. It is much more professional than just using YouTube, and the data that we get from Wistia helps us really understand how our content is being consumed. Other things about Wistia, they have a ton of great resources, free resources, um, for you to learn how to make better videos. Tutorials on lighting and editing, choosing the right microphone, all kinds of things like that, as well as other people in the Wistia community to help you improve. They also have a free version of their service that holds up to 50 videos. So go check them out. It's wistia.com, W-I-S-T-I-A.com. It's an awesome product. But what I want you to do, instead of just going to their website, go to phillytech.org and then click on the sponsors page and then click on Wistia through there so that they know that we sent you. It's a great product. Definitely check it out. Or even better... Go over to the show notes, view all the shows, all the notes we found and we worked so hard on, and click there as well. If there's a link it's in the show notes. There. Always Initially. good to look at the show notes. Yes, because we worked so hard on the show notes. So, next, onward and upward. Remember TweetDeck? I remember TweetDeck. Do you still use it at all? No. I mean, of course I do. No, I don't. I play with it every now and then. Actually, it's open on my computer right now. I, I mean, I like it for the most part, but it only really does Twitter. You know why? Because Twitter bought them. Because Twitter bought them. Yeah, TweetDeck used to be a phenomenal tool that managed all the different networks. And when Twitter bought them, I at that point knew, why would Twitter keep up a tool that focuses so well on Facebook or focuses so well on everything else? I knew that it was just going to become a great way, another way to really look at Twitter, a powerful way to look at Twitter, yes. um, but not necessarily an all-encompassing dashboard. Um, like which, Hootsuite. Like, like Hootsuite. Um, yeah, like Hootsuite. There's other ones that do it, but Hootsuite's kind of a good, uh, a good choice that way. But if you are all about Twitter and you're working with Teams, um, I think this is, you know, there's two TweetDeck stories that we're going to talk about. This first one, which is, hey, you're going to use your Twitter account to log in to TweetDeck. Yeah, um, so yeah, so, being, so Twitter TweetDeck accounts are being scrapped at, on March 31st. And be, are being replaced by Twitter logins. So if you used to have a TweetDeck, um, TweetDeck login, Deck login. Better, better get moving on the Twitter, Twitter handle and reset up your columns now while you still can. Yeah. Well, and you know what the funny thing is? Um, I actually was checking, do I have a TweetDeck login? And the answer was, I don't think I do because it's been so long, I think I removed my account when it got changed over to Twitter because I stopped using it. Um, I... 
I'm kind of that way. If I know that I'm not going to use a tool anymore, I tend to get rid of my account just so that it's not right. out there. Because, um, again, TweetDeck wow. had access to a Twitter account, so I removed all those access I things. Removed those. I got you, yeah. Yeah, I didn't just say, well, I'm not going to use it anymore. I actually pulled out the authentications that it had. Um, yeah, I definitely did that. I, I didn't delete my account, but I had to reauthorize everything. Yeah. Well, so switching those credentials, if you still use TweetDeck and you're still logging in without Twitter, now is the time to go do that because it actually is part of a larger enhancement, which is managing teams through TweetDeck is now which a is much cool. more cool process, which I have to say, this is a reason to jump back into TweetDeck if you are an active Twitter user and there are teams managing things together. Yeah, but my, my whole thing is like, is this a little too much, too a little extra too late? Because like, the thing is, it's Twitter. It's just Twitter. It's not Facebook. It's not LinkedIn. It's not multi. You know, I mean, Hootsuite does it better. And now well, with the Hootsuite re redesign, I mean, Hootsuite. I used to like TweetDeck and how the the white space between each tweet was a little bit easier for me to read. You know, but then Hootsuite went about and re rejiggered the whole layout a little bit and made the white space a little bit better. Now Hootsuite's just as good. One thing I like about TweetDeck is that there's a native Mac and native PC version, so I don't have to go to a browser. I can have it open as its, its own instance. Right. Well, let's think about it this way. You and I tend to use an account where we're managing multiple clients, so a tool like Hootsuite is absolutely invaluable. TweetDeck is almost like, because it's only Twitter, it's the exact opposite tool that we're looking for. But if you think about, um, let's say a company is trying to do large-scale customer support. So you have a half a dozen people who are all monitoring that one company Twitter account so that they can keep up to and do things like that. Well, now all of a sudden, you have a whole team of people. TweetDeck is a great answer for that. So yes, if that yeah. team is, is saying our job is to monitor this Twitter account, now they have a, a way to do it to really um, handle that without having, you know, 10 different people all with one user account and password sharing it. So the moment someone, um, this may sound strange, but the moment someone leaves and gets fired, mm -hmm. you have to then have a fire drill and change all those accounts out. The other thing that I think it will do is Twitter will know who posted what tweet. So if a corporate mm -hmm. account posts something and it's through that tweet deck application, there's actually going to be a record that says, Howard's account is what posted to Pepsi, not the the global Pepsi account. So yeah, it was to the global Pepsi account, but they'll know was it the advertise was it the uh, the PR company was it one of the employees? They'll have a, a mechanism for tracking that, which actually ties into a story that we did many weeks ago, all about um, Twitter trying to get better with um, bullying with mm -hmm. trolling. So having that tracking mechanism is part of that, saying, I know who posted this because we don't want people sharing accounts. So we're going to do everything we can to make it so that no one has to share their account. Exactly. You can share the global account, but you have your own account into that account. It's kind of meta, but you know. Yeah. Well, and it also might prevent things like, I don't know which account I'm tweeting from. So instead of having two accounts on your mobile app where you're like, oh, which I have to switch between account A and account B, mm -hmm. if you're tweeting through TweetDeck, you know you're tweeting for the company. And if you're yes. tweeting on your mobile app, you're tweeting as yourself. So yes. and that is you have cross stuff. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's going to be a very useful tool for the right team. I am not the right team. You probably aren't the right team. Mm -hmm. But... If you're that right team, uh, it's a good tool for you. It is. I, mean, I wonder if, if Twitter's going to come up with a, um, a pricing mechanism for it. It wouldn't yeah. shock me. <laughs> I'm saying it's kind of silly for them not to say, all right, if you have more than three people, you need to pay. I mean, they bought this tool mainly to shut it down because they didn't like the third-party apps. But they're not saying, hey, we got this tool. We get the resources to play with it. Let's use it. I'm well, kind of happy to see them do that. You know, say, "Hey, there's this tool out here. We bought. We spent a nice amount of money on. I mean, I knew the people. I knew the founder of TweetDeck. We interviewed so, him on the on the A2SM podcast. And you know, back then, I mean, he was thrilled when you know they were bought out because he, you know, he made a nice amount of money. So, and he actually joined Twitter. So, well, think about it this way: now with TweetDeck, if they have a, if they can use it to promote their own ad products. 
to make it so it's like, oh, well, managing ads can be done through TweetDeck. Now it's more use of their ad platform because, again, mm -hmm. if you have a larger company that's got multiple people managing an account, that's great there. It's also something where, um, you know, I, I just think about it this way. If Twitter is going to be doing more and more in terms of trying to be relevant for lots of different reasons, trying to be that heartbeat of the Internet, well, this is a great app to do it. Uh, I'm all for it. I, th I think it's going to be a, uh, a great thing for companies. Um, honestly, a great thing for the people who work for those companies that are going to want to separate their personal lives from their work lives. They're not going to want those things to, to co-mingle. Exactly. And another great thing for the Internet would be our next sponsor, Flywheel. Our next sponsor is Flywheel. And Flywheel is a managed WordPress hosting platform, and it's built specifically for designers and creative agencies. Basically what they do is they make it really simple to build, launch, and manage client sites with their dashboard built from the ground up for the modern web developer. This is managed WordPress hosting in a really amazing way. Nightly backups, fast load times, WordPress-specific security, and a great team that is a support team that's filled with WordPress people. So when you have a WordPress question, they actually know the answer to it because mm -hmm. they're not trying to figure out, like, well, how, what are you trying to host there? They know you're w working with WordPress, and they know WordPress, so there isn't a guessing game. Oh, well, maybe it's a plugin that's interfering. They'll know exactly what's going on. Flywheel mm -hmm. helps thousands of designers across the world launch their projects every day. So what I want you to do is go to phillytech.org, go to our either the show notes page and click on the link there for the Flywheel uh, sponsor link, and uh, make sure to let them know by clicking on that link there or clicking on it um, from our sponsors page. This way, they know that we sent you. So, uh, and if you go to fly, if you go to getflywheel.com directly, uh, make sure to mention us and put in some kind of note saying we love phillytech.org. Thank you for sponsoring them. And you can also enter to get a free T-shirt, which I wore to that today. I mean, I wear my Wistia shirt now, but <laughs> you can get a free flywheel shirt, and they're pretty rad. So, ah, uh, free T-shirts. I'm all about the free T-shirts. Exactly. And actually, as a side note, I I have all my clients over here. All but one client is on flywheel, and Literally, I had an issue. I said, guys, what's going on with this? Like, what did I do? Or like, there was a security issue. And it turns out, no, that's us. We're just doing something on that side. And they're very they're very responsive. They're very friendly. They're very outgoing. They're, they really, really, and they get to know you. I can't say, hey, guys, it's Seth. I'm working on X client. What's going on? Or, hey, hey guys, it's Seth. X client's not working well. What, what did I do wrong? Because most likely it's what you did wrong because they're so secure. Right. So it's really good. So something else that might not be so good or could be good depending on what you think, Instagram offers new clickable carousel ads. Whoa. Well, th this, again, I was talking about this before. I like it when a platform experiments with their product to see what they can do. So if I think about it this way, Traditionally on Instagram, you would see a photo. It's there. you got one choice. You can either double tap it to like it, to give it the little heart. You can comment on it. But you can't link to anything from there. Mm -hmm. So what they're basically saying is we want sponsored Instagram posts to have links in them. So they're... It, which is good. Again, my biggest criticism of Instagram for a long time has been I can't link to anything from it. So now if I as an advertiser or as a brand have the ability to say, well, I can put links in there, it might cost me money, I might have to pay for it, it but I can not actually money. have a call to action. Well, it, exactly. Um, it, but it, even, it, better, it, <laughs> even better, I can now scroll through the ads. And I was trying it on, uh, on their little, you know, looking at their video and looking at what they're going to do. I think that's pretty cool. I think it's a nice way to do it because... Again, it's not just going to do it for you. You control it. You mm -hmm. tell it, I want to look at these different things. So they'll be able to measure, are people engaging with my content and just not clicking the call to action? Or are they just skipping it all together? So they'll have some very nice metrics that they can give their advertisers. Um, again, this is one of those things where I am not against ads on the Internet. I think they support the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, a way of doing things. I am against ham-handed approaches to advertising, something that will clearly, clearly tell the audience that we don't like you. 
And Instagram's found a really good balance. Um, I remember when they first introduced uh, sponsored posts, and I was like, oh, great, sponsored posts. And I realized I might see one a day, maybe two a day, and it yeah, really has so. gotten more. I like it. I see the sponsored posts, I'm like, oh, I like that. I actually find their choices are pretty good. Yeah, some of them like W Hotel, they they did do a good job of saying, Hey, look at our look at this look at this great view. I mean there's, some of them are actually kind of funny. Some of the videos that the brands do, they almost use their they pay to put out a funny video. It really has nothing Absolutely. to do with the brand. It's just Absolutely. saying, Hey, I tripped over the file cabinet today. And well, like, and again, it's that funny. short. It's just short video, mm -hmm. so they are still in the bound. Like they're still creating content for this platform. It's not just recycled. Um, so yeah, if they can be creative with it, I'm gonna like it. So, you know, the fact that you could have a sponsored segment where you've got a couple of pictures to look through, and then a button that lets you click off the site and go to their website. Mm -hmm. I think that's a pretty. Uh, it's a nice, innovative way to look at an ad, at an ad product compared to what we were talking about with Pinterest before, which seems very ham-handed. So I'm giving, I'm giving uh, Instagram the thumbs up on this one. Thumbs up. A nice big thumbs up. Over in the spirit, thumb up. I was going to say, in the spirit of the Facebook thumbs up, since they're owned by Facebook, I like it, Pinterest. There I mean, yeah. Instagram. Pinterest. Pinterest? <laughs> Don't like it. I give Pinterest the dislike. Exactly, exactly. So, update. This is updated. Why Facebook pages, why Facebook pages likes most likely will drop on the twelfth. So pretty much what that means is is that on the twelfth you're going to see a nice little drop in your Facebook likes. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. These means that these are people that are actually not real. They're not going to be. They're just going to not be part of your your like anymore, like stream anymore, which is right. a good thing because they weren't providing you any value besides saying, I have I have ton more followers that don't actually exist than you do. Well, and think about it this way. Um, I know I've always advised clients that if they focus on the number of likes they have on their page as their key metric, that it's the wrong metric. They mm -hmm. should be focusing on the actual um, click through to their site, the actual engagement with their content, rather than just, oh, well, I have 723 likes and now I have 727 likes, so four more, everyone go have a beer. Like, I, it's, not, it's not about that. So, you know, I've always said don't focus on that number. Now, mm -hmm. here's what's going to happen. If you are one of those people that was focusing on that number, you're going to see it drop and you're going to be really, really bummed. But your engagement stats, stats, when you look at those insights, you're going to notice that your math gets a little bit better. So your engagement is going to look like, hey, my engagement just got a little bit better because that 3 to 5 to 10% of Facebook users that didn't even care about me or, and one of the things Facebook confirmed was they're getting rid of the deceased accounts from your mm -hmm. like numbers because it's like, this account is inactive. Don't, we're not going to count it anymore. So... Yeah, That's the kind of thing where, look, if the account's inactive, if the person is deceased, Dead. if yeah. the account hasn't been used, we're taking it out. It'll make your math better except for the number of likes. So that's, you know. And, but again, they want to show, Facebook wants to say to people, the engagement is better because then they can sell. What are they selling? Money for the answer. Oh, no, you're supposed to answer. I was oh, kidding you. sorry. What is Facebook selling? People, ads, eyes. Ads. They're selling that. Mm -hmm. So if they, if all of a sudden your stats look a little bit better. Sorry, that's a little too late. I, I tried. I tried so hard. Um, if, <laughs> if all of a sudden those insights look better and, you be, and it becomes something where it's like, oh, it is much more valuable for me to buy ads on Facebook, well, that's good for Facebook. So, yes, this is one of those things where it'll be a little bit painful, and then it'll be awesome, and then you'll give Facebook more money. So, it'll mm. all work out. It'll all work out. And another thing that's kind of scary is, as of, on March 5th, Twitter announced the, the launch of Partner Audiences, a feature that lets advertisers target users based on their activity outside the network. I'm not sure how I feel about this. <laughs> um, I, this is, I, it's it, a little dirty. Well, it's dirty, except everybody's doing it already. So True. this is one of those things that uh, sometimes people will say to me, how come the ad from such and such, you know, I was looking at this shirt on it, this yeah. site. How come this ad is following me from this site to this site to this site? Well, all that 
Twitter's basically doing is saying, we're going to participate in that too. So if people are buying ads on Twitter, we're going to know that they were also looking at this shirt on Land's End and, you know, and that Land's End ad is now following them around and it'll follow them to Twitter as well. So... Everyone's uh, doing it, so let's join on the bandwagon. Right, but the good thing is, and again, this is something Twitter's always been very good at, is the way that you opt out of it on Twitter is very simple. It's two mm-hmm. checkboxes. Um, it's not one checkbox because there's two pieces of this puzzle. It's two checkboxes. Um, but it's in your basic privacy settings, and you just click those two checkboxes, and you're out, and they give you an explanation of what it's actually doing. Um, so from a transparency standpoint, that's fine. I think that most people won't even notice that this is happening. They're because, opted in. They're opted in. Well, opt in. Because the, the, well, because whether they opt in or opt out, um, they're just gonna they're gonna hang around because the way ads show up on Twitter, it doesn't look like the ad is following you the way that the Google AdWords ad or the, the other ad networks, the way that those ads follow you around, it's damn creepy. It's like I was just looking at this product and it's now showing me this product on this other site. On Twitter, you're gonna get a better you're gonna get a different ad product because it's not gonna show you those same things. Exactly. I know when I was working for the my former company, I was doing like pharmaceutical research and stuff and mm-hmm. and that stuff was, and then typically I did it on my logged into Google under my personal account. And for days, it would say, you want to see this thing? I'm like, no, I don't care about that. And then the YouTube ads, the pre-rolls would say stuff about that. I'm like, I don't care about CRM. Now I do. Yeah, but. yeah I actually have a stunt browser that I use. Um, whenever I'm doing research for someone, I use a stunt browser because the last thing that I want ah, is, ha- is to add that. So um, I actually have a very clean version of Firefox that is all that I use it for is research for other people's stuff. Because you get some pretty interesting ads. Well, because I just don't really want those ads. I mean, this can be research for stuff for my kids. It can be research for stuff for my wife, for a client. Whatever it is, I don't want those ads following me around. I actually like the ads that follow me around because it's for stuff that I'm interested in. It's like it makes you buy more stuff. Well, whether it makes me buy more stuff or not, but I don't feel like these ads are irrelevant. So mm, it doesn't bother time. me. When I see a relevant ad... I don't, I'm not bothered by it. I'm a little bit mm. like, oh, that's, you know, sometimes I think about what they did to get it. And, yeah, it's a little bit creepy, but um, it's still, I'd rather a relevant ad than something that isn't for me. So mm. I use a stunt browser when I do other people's work. Absolutely. And here's, here's a company that's right for most people. Bad segue. Oh. Zoho Mail. Zoho Mail. Well, what we want to do here at the network is we really want to thank our sponsor, Zoho Mail. Zoho Mail is professional email that is designed for your business, and it's got business class features, security, and the convenience of both web and mobile access. So learn more about Zoho Mail, and you can sign up for a free ad-free account for up to 10 users by clicking on the link in our show notes or, again, by going to phillytech.org slash sponsors, I think is what it is. And then you can see Soho Mail and let us know that, or let them know that we sent you. So that is Zoho Mail. Pretty great features. I actually, um, working with a a longtime client of mine, uh, they really want to step up their game a little bit, and I full-on had them go to Zoho Mail and a couple other Zoho products. I'm pretty uh, excited to have them start with that, so... Absolutely. I use them for I use them for the fully typed out work email, and I use them for a startup I'm part of. I use I actually full disclosure I use for the startup I'm using the the free account. It's because we're a startup and bootstrapping, but we will be moving to the premium account very shortly because we're finding that we need more space. Well, and that's one of the things that's great about it that you can actually use it and standardize on it and get comfortable work with it. Work it into your environment as opposed to saying you have seven days to figure it out or 30 days to figure it out. So often when I sign up for trials, I think to myself, you know what, if I could just have one more week, I could actually make a decision or you know, you sign up for a trial and then you can't touch it for another couple weeks because you're busy with something. So I like the fact that you can actually use it in your environment, really get, get the rhythm of it. And mm-hmm. then when you start saying, you know what, this is awesome, I want to do more with it, that's when they say, okay, time to pay. Well, that's perfect because at that I point, I'm money. totally willing to pay. Yeah, it's Absolutely. like, yes, please, here is my credit card. Take it now. Absolutely. So let's move on to our picture. Card. No. <laughs> this card. 
And then let's move on to the picks of the week. My pick of the week is something called Vivaldi. It is by the makers of Opera. Many people will remember Opera from a while back. It's an alternate browser. Well, so is Vivaldi. It's based off the Chrome architecture, per, per se, but it's clean. It, it's actually really zippy and fast. They have Vivaldi email. If you want to have some um, additional email, just what everyone else needs is more email. But they have, it, it's a little sleeker. It's, it's skinned differently. They're in another tech preview. Um, I think it's neat. It's, it's a pretty browser. It's nice to have another version of Chrome right. you know, to provide for my stunt browser, pretty much. But, you know, I mean, it's based on Chrome. I mean, maybe that's a better thing because it's, it's proven. I can't really knock it because, I mean, Android itself, you know, it, it, I mean, Amazon does, you know, it's Android, pretty much. It's just right. its own skin. So, I mean, I don't know. It, it's worth downloading giving it a whirl. It's on Mac, it's on Linux, it's on Windows. Give it a whirl. I'm going to try and use it a little bit and use it for my stump browser. What do you think, Howard? It, it's, again, this is one of those things where I'm going to end up downloading it because I always have to download browsers to try things out, make sure that it works. Um, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Um, I probably am going to wait till it's out of its technical preview just because there's only so many things I have in my, I can do at one given time. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm, I'm definitely... Uh, hey, look, it's another thing that's based on uh, the Chromium open source kit, so it's probably going to work um, from a web development standpoint. It's going to work the same way as the other it ones. Does. But um, which is Which is great. It means you don't have to write more code. Um, mm -hmm. But if it, if it does some other things that are neat, makes browsing a little bit easier, a little faster, that would be awesome. So oh, let me cool. tell you about my pick. pick. I'm gonna well, my pick sure. is actually a application which is called Mailplane. And let's see here. Let's see. Mac share. only. It, it, Mailplane is Mac only, but because it is Mac only, the goal of Mailplane, I, I'm screen sharing. I got it going here. Oh, you um, do? I, uh, I do. On. That's all right. See, there we go. Moving on. Um, Mailplane, what it is, is it is Gmail but it is a native application for Gmail. So it still gives you the same basic Gmail interface, but it gives you some extra features that specifically things like it becomes your Mac's default mail application. So when you click oh, on a link nice. in something, instead of saying, oh, I've got to open another tab or copy it in, it just opens it over, you know, it just opens a new message. Um, it also does some things in terms of its integrations. Um, it's got some uh, different Google things that you can do with Apple Script. Hmm? You like Boomerang too, you know? I I am a huge fan of Boomerang. There's also it's got built-in Reportive. Um, yes. Reportive is another tool. It shows you all the social profiles. There are some really great things that you get that a native mail application gives you, and now you don't have to compromise. You can use a Gmail application, and it also works for Google Apps. Um, it's very generous, so that. I have multiple computers. I can use Mailplane on any computers that I log into. So I don't. I for twenty five bucks, I have a native app, um, and it's also because it's Gmail. Everything stays synchronized. Um, it uses the notification center on the Mac. So all the good Mac stuff that you want out of a native application, you get. I, I know this is one of those things where um, I love an application like this because it. It's what it said is Gmail is awesome, but Gmail does not play nicely with your um, with mail.app, the native uh, application for the Mac. It just it just doesn't the two of them don't do well. So I really like the fact that you can, um, uh, for lack of a better term, you get all the features of a native app, but you still get to use Gmail if Gmail is your client. Um, and this is something where you know what I I have mail.app for certain accounts of mine that I use. And for my uh, Google Apps account, for my uh, all my HowardYermish.com stuff, which is running through Google Apps, um, Zoho. I, ha I actually have Zoho set up, so Zoho is through Boomerang. I mean, not Boomerang is through um, Mailplane. So I'm checking it through there because it's um, what I have. It is I have my Gmail app reading my Zoho Mail, so I can do everything inside of that. Again, that's one of the things that's so flexible about Zoho is I can kind of use it where I want, and because it was easy enough for me to set it up through Gmail and do stuff there. I can manage both accounts through there, and now I have it as a native app as well. So I don't really have to leave 
and go to multiple things. I can kind of, you know, use this native application for what it's great for. So love it, love it, love it. Twenty five bucks, well spent. They don't version upgrade like crazy. They've been. Um, I'm constantly getting updates to the application, so they're always posting new things, but they're posting things like 3.3.1, 3.3.7. So you're getting those kinds of point updates as opposed to like 3.1 and the next version is 3.5 and then two months later is 4.0, pay us another 20 bucks. They don't do that. Um, I can't remember when I had to pay the $25. It was many years ago, I think when I was on version 2. Um, I've been using uh, MailPlane, I want to say, for at least five years. Wow. Uh, for a very, very long time. Um, I don't know if it was as long as it came out, but I've been using it for a long time. I actually just found another ver I was looking at. I quickly Googled, like, Gmail yeah. for Windows. Oh, I'm sure that there's one. That'll be your pick for next week. No, Mailbird looks interesting. Yep. I'm not sure, but, you know, best email client for Windows. I, I, like, the, I, like, the, I, like, the, I like the actual interface. Of, <clears throat> excuse me. I actually like the, the Gmail interface. I like that everything is kind of where I need to be. So Well, and what's interesting is when you actually use MailPlane, you get the Gmail interface, but you also get Mac, Mac tools. So when mm. I use Gmail in a browser, like I very often, if I need to use Gmail somewhere, I, I use it in a browser and I don't lose anything because I'm still, I can sign into my Google account, mail there, it's all native in the browser. But on my home computer, I have all, I want all the shortcuts, I want all the tools, I want all the integration. Um, so again, it's Gmail, so it's synchronized. I don't have to do anything special, I just, I just use it. I'm jealous. Um, I'm great. jealous. I'll it's it. pretty, pretty great. I'll admit it. Well, that was our show. Quick shortcuts, uh, love it. Love it. Quick shortcuts, you know, you know Apple, it, you know, Howard is a Apple fanboy. It's allowed to be. I think we actually lost Howard just then. Anyhow, thank you for being part of our show this week, and we will see you next week, same time, same station, and have fun out there and explore the social web. And exactly. I think Howard, Howard All right, is good night, everybody. Just in time to say good night. <laughs> see you guys. Good night. Take care. <laughs>